You're listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church, recorded at one of our worship services. And now I will read our scripture passage for the day, which comes from Acts chapter 16, verses 6 to 15. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come up to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go on into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is the leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days, and on the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate to the riverside, where we were supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshipper of God. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. And she prevailed upon us. These are the true words of the living God. Thanks, Divya. Good morning, everyone. Happy New Year. It's great to see you all this morning, first Sunday of the new year, and I trust that it's going to be a great year for everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be back in Singapore. Some of you may know we were uh, back visiting our home country, uh, South Africa, where we're from, uh, for a while, our first time back in five years, and so it was really wonderful to be there for a long period of time. Uh, and I had a very uh, RHC welcome back this morning, because when I walked into the office at about seven minutes past seven this morning, who was walking out of the office? One of the staff members who was caught in the, I caught him in the process of pranking my office on the way back in. <laughs> so that's a, that's a very RHC thing to happen. So Elliot, uh, <laughs> you guys can all get Elliot back on my behalf, all right? Uh, so, but it really is wonderful to be back. All right, well, let's get into the scriptures today. We've been preaching through Acts for quite a while. We take breaks periodically. We wrapped up at the end of, uh, well, chapter 16, verse 5, the end of that section a couple of weeks ago, and now we are diving back in today, Acts chapter 16. So, maybe as we start, uh, let me start my timer. Uh, a new year, friends, is uh, actually a gift from God. I don't know if any of you ever think about that. But I used to think that, you know, days, months, weeks, years, it's all irrelevant. God doesn't care about those things. Until I read Genesis 1, and I realized it tells us that God puts the sun in the, in the sky, and God determines the years and the seasons and the days. And the scriptures tell us God's mercies are new for us every morning. And a new year, in some ways, it's not the end of the world or that significant, but in another sense, it's a new start. It's a new year to look ahead and trust God and ask God to be with us and draw from His grace that He wants to give us endlessly and live for Him. And maybe you look back on 2022, maybe it was a rough year, a difficult year, maybe a year you're glad to see the, the end of, maybe it's a year in which you did things that you're ashamed of or you have much guilt about. Friends, we can carry our sins and shame to the foot of the cross. We can confess them to God and to others. We can have Him wash them all away. And we can start a new year with new mercies from our Lord who loves us and wants to walk with us. And so you don't have to make New Year's resolutions into a big thing, but I would encourage all of us to decide in our hearts to live for Jesus this year and to know that His grace is for us. Now, one of the, the, the spiritual highlights of our trip, we, we had many highlights, but one of the spiritual highlights of our trip was visiting a church uh, on a Sunday evening, and uh, there, were whole, there were some old friends there that we hadn't seen for, for many years, and we went to visit them. They, their church had just moved into a new building, and uh, they had just built this building during COVID, 
and there was a bit of a faith story attached to it. They built a two and a half thousand seater building and they felt God just before COVID, you know, tell them they had this land and to build this building and they moved forward and then COVID struck and they had to raise by South African standards, a hang of a lot of money in a fairly short space of time. And they did everything they could. They were, they were faithful. They cut salaries. The pastor gave up his car so he could walk for a couple of months. And just they were like, they were all in. And the deadline came to, to pay the final bill, and they just didn't have all the money in the bank. They had about 10% left to pay, and they didn't have it. They had, they had nothing. Uh, churches in other parts of the world don't really operate like Singapore with reserves and healthy surpluses, all right? This is like real life in the rest of the world, and there was no money. And the elders got together, and they were praying, and someone gave them a gift that was about one, about like less than 1% of the total building fund amount. It was a, a lot of money, but less than 10% of what they owed in like a couple of days' time. And the elders were praying about this, trusting God, and one of them felt God lead him to say they should give this money away to a church down the road that really needed it. Now, that's kind of crazy, right? Can I get an amen here? Anyone think that's kind of crazy? Yeah, that's kind of crazy. And so they prayed about it, they prayed, and they, they felt, no, this, this is what we're called to do. And they did that in faith. Seems crazy. And a couple of days later, some little old lady... They still do not know who it is. She came in driving an old beat-up car, apparently not even from the church, with a mask, nameless, faceless, drove up and said, 46 years ago, my family started collecting gold coins, and it's been passed down to me. And a few weeks ago, I felt God speak to me and tell me that I must give all of this to the church that pleases him. I don't even think she was part of that church. She said, here it is, and she drove out, and that was about 90% of that final amount that they needed. Now, why do I tell you this this morning? Because this passage today, in this passage, we see God guiding and speaking to his people in somewhat surprising ways that don't make sense initially. But that's what we see happening in our passage, God actively guiding Paul and his team for his kingdom's sake, and for them to be involved in a great adventure. And friends, maybe this is part of God's mercies to you for this year, an invitation for you to walk with him. The context of our passage is Paul and Barnabas have split in chapter 15 due to a disagreement. So even in Acts, when we see amazing things like this, the context is Paul just had a fight with Barnabas. They couldn't see eye to eye, so they went different ways. And now Paul has taken Silas and he's picked up Timothy to go back and strengthen the churches that he had planted previously. And we're going to see today that Paul and his, his companions go about ministry seeking to be faithful. They're proactive. They're not just waiting around, kind of twiddling their thumbs. They are men on a mission obeying the Bible and what Jesus told them to do. But they're also going to get interrupted and empowered by God to fulfill his plans. And we have only two points today, and the first one I'm warning you is the majority of the sermon. The second really just emphasizes the point in a slightly different way later on. But firstly, we see how God guides us specifically for his purposes, and secondly, how God causes kingdom growth, which we cannot. So what happens? In verse 6 and 7, we see that after ministering in uh, Phrygia and Galatia, uh, Paul, and Paul wanted to go southwest down to the province of Asia. So he wants to go south, maybe Ephesus. But it says in verse 6 that the Spirit, the Holy Spirit, prevented him. Now, we aren't told how the Spirit prevented him. Was there a prophecy? Was it a sense in his own heart? Did he have an inward, audible voice of the Spirit speaking to him? Was it just circumstantial, but he deduced that the Spirit was preventing him? We don't know. But it says the Holy Spirit prevented him going southwest toward Asia. And... Then he uh, heads toward Mysia and tries to go north to Bithynia, but again it says the Spirit of Jesus, another phrase for the Holy Spirit, prevented him from going to Bithynia. So he's coming from the east, he can't go north or south, and so he moves west toward Troas. And while he's uh, trying to do that, he has a vision of a Macedonian man, a man from Macedonia. I think we have someone from Macedonia here this morning. And we do in the second row. Uh, he had a vision of Stefan, this strong uh, bearded man. 
And this man is, in his vision, is, is, is appealing to him, calling to him and saying, come and help us, come. Now, I mean, not every dream is a dream from God, right? Uh, that's not all my dreams are dreams from God, let me tell you that. But yet, waking up, this circumstances, what's happened, they, they seem to discern that God's called them to Macedonia. And so he ends, they end up heading for Macedonia. Now, what, what you can't see unless you look at a map is that they've gone hundreds of miles in a very circuitous route. They have not gone from A to B. And they weren't flying on SQ. I mean, this is like walking, horses, this is difficult journeys. And some of us are thinking, God, like if you're asking Paul to do all this stuff, could you not at least have made his journey more efficient? Made it quicker, easier for him? And yet they go on a long circuit. I mean, it's a little bit like if I say, hey, I'm you know, driving from here, I want to drop someone off at Novena, and then I go via Woodlands. Is there a reason to do that? Maybe, but it's not immediately apparent to everyone. And God has taken them on what seems to be a, 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 a somewhat roundabout route. And Paul must have been somewhat perplexed about this. It didn't seem to make much sense. And let's, let's think. What Paul was planning to do seemed logical. Jesus had told them to go and make disciples, to go to the Gentiles. Uh, it was certainly biblical. It was practical. And he's going back to visit these churches. And yet, while he's doing things that seem to be completely right and normal, there's nothing wrong with what he's doing. God says, don't go there. Don't go there. Come, my boy this way. Now, let's think a little bit about how Paul has traveled up until now. In Acts 9, God tells Paul, you're going to be a light to the Gentiles, and you're going to suffer for my name. He starts ministering in Damascus, which is where he was on his way to when he got converted, so he starts there. But then he flees for his life with the help of his friends and flees to Jerusalem. And then when people are trying to kill him in Jerusalem, he flees for his life again to Tarsus. I mean, we see Paul's very happy to flee a place <laughs> if he's about to die. In Acts 11, then, Barnabas comes to Tarsus and says to Paul, hey, come and help me in Antioch. The church is like expanding here and I need help. So he goes to Antioch. And then in Acts 13, he leaves Antioch. Why? Because while they were praying and fasting, Acts 13, 1, the Spirit said, set apart Paul and Barnabas for the work I've called them to do. And then they go traveling around. Later on in Acts, we're going to see that Paul feels he must go to Jerusalem. But there's going to be prophecies that tell him that if he goes to Jerusalem, he's going to get bound in chains and suffering is awaiting him there. And previously, when Paul was being persecuted, he fled, right? Yes. But now Paul is going to go to Jerusalem and he's going to tell people in Acts 20, now I go to Jerusalem knowing that prison and affliction await me there. Yet I do not consider my life worth anything so long as I may finish the task God has given to me. What is going on here, friends? We see here that Paul employs a whole variety of means that determine where he goes. Sometimes it's practical. Someone comes and asks for help. There's a door that opens to him. Sometimes the Spirit leads him. Sometimes he's being persecuted and he has to flee. But we see here in our passage that the Spirit clearly guides Paul and his team. Verse 6, the Spirit prevents him speaking the word in Asia. The Spirit of Jesus prevents him going to Bithynia, and now through a dream, a Macedonian man in a vision calling him. It doesn't tell us exactly how this guidance worked. I think sometimes we read these passages and we wish we knew. Did the Spirit speak an inward, audible voice? Or was it a few people saying, hey, I just had this idea, and then they pray about it, and they all feel a peace about it? We don't actually know. But God clearly guided them in this way. In other words, friends, Paul's travels here seem to be a mix of him making decisions by common sense, following the Bible, fleeing for his life, responding to requests, and the Spirit's somewhat strange guidance too. In other words, Paul's being biblical, obeying Jesus. He's got strategy. He's deducing various things. But ultimately, he's submissive to God's guidance and God's will. And in fact, even in verse 10, uh, when he does go to Macedonia, he has to conclude that God's calling him there. That's what the language is, concluding that God called us to preach the gospel to them. It's not even crystal clear. He's after being blocked there, blocked there, and then this vision, he's like, this is what it seems to be. In other words, even God's guidance wasn't perfectly clear. Wisdom and discernment were still needed. So friends, what we're seeing here 
is that in the Christian life, and in this passage, there is both the general will of God, and there's the specific ways that God sometimes guides us individually. Now, I trust that all of us this morning are committed to the general will of God. Can I get an amen? amen. We're all happy to obey God. First Thessalonians chapter 4, the will of God is, I mean, some people come to you, you know, what is the will of God for my life? First Thessalonians chapter 4, the will of God is your sanctification. Be more and more like Jesus, to know Him and to love Him. All right? Uh, so, oh, my, why does my left my iPad keep turning off? I trust that's not the Lord's guidance. Maybe he wants me to sit down this morning. But here we see, friends, that God is, is guiding. Um, he gives us these, these kind of general ways. And we're to be very committed to this. As Christians, we read the Bible. We know what he's calling us to do. Uh, if I were to ask this morning, is it God's will for you this year to scam somebody in a crypto Ponzi scheme? The answer is no, Right? Great, but assuming we all want to please God and we want to serve Him, sometimes what we find is God does lead us and guide us in more specific ways. In other words, you can't only just apply one principle and say, okay, I've got my life all figured out now. God wants to invite us into a personal relationship with Him where amidst all the general will possibilities of us, do we share the gospel here or there? Um, do we love this person or focus our attentions there? Our jobs, all those kinds of things, God can lead us and guide us. Paul's proactive. He's setting off on, on a mission. He's not sitting there saying, look, I'm not going to do anything unless God tells me exactly where to go. No, God's told him to make disciples. He's on a mission. He's going. And yet he's conscious and aware and being led by God in this way. Sometimes people say, well, God doesn't lead us and guide us in these ways anymore because, you know, now we have the Bible. And in scriptural time, they didn't have the Bible, so they needed this extra guidance. But the guidance that God gives Paul here is not about doctrine or theology that we get in the Bible. It's about don't go to Asia, don't go to Bithynia, and go to Macedonia. You can't figure that out by reading the Bible. And God wants to lead and to guide us in a similar way too. So the point, friends, while Paul's happy to get on and live his life proactively by assuming many things, he's keenly aware of the God who's personally leading him. In other words, Jesus, friends, to us, is not a principle, but Jesus is a person that we follow. And Jesus, the person, deals with you and I in beautifully personal ways. When he converted Paul, he revealed himself to Paul. Paul says, who are you, Lord? He says, I, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Now, nah, I've, I've got a mission for you. He goes and gives him, he tells him, he's going to reveal to him what, what he wants Paul to do with his life. He says, you're going to be a light to the Gentiles. He tells Ananias, I'll show him how much he's going to have to suffer for, for, for my name. God sometimes does things in somewhat unusual ways. You think about Abraham. When God wants to create a people for himself that will be his people, he goes and picks a hundred-year-old man whose wife is barren and doesn't have children. Why? To show that God's ways are not our ways, and God's going to bring life out of what appears to be death. God comes to him and says, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. He's like, no, God, I mean, nice idea, but hello. <laughs> or Gideon, he's going to fight against the enemies. He's got a, a, an army of 10,000, and God's like, hey, whittle them down, get them down, until you've only got 300 men. Now we're going to defeat them to show you that I am God, to show all the nations. Friends, God sometimes does these things. And God deals with us in beautiful personal ways. One of the wonderful things that happened um, when we were away that was very personally encouraging to me um, actually begins about 15 years ago. So 15 years ago, I was sitting in a church service, and I just bought like a very nice pen for my lifestyle and budget at the time. It was a Parker Sonnet pen. I can't remember how much it cost. It was like, the equivalent was like $30 or something, $40. It was, it was, it was a nice pen. And I was, in, I love this pen. I'm just telling you. It's like beautiful. Um, Divya, don't roll your eyes at me, okay? And, but I was sitting in a, in a church service a few months after I bought this pen. Uh, and there was a visiting preacher who I knew and loved very much. And in the service, I felt God prompt me to give it to him as a gift. Oh, really? And to encourage him with something, which I did. I did. But Tara reminded me, it was, it was hard. It was hard. I forgot about this, right? Put the, pain out of my, put the pain out of my mind. Anyway, 
15 years later, friends, I mean, that's, that could be the end of the story, right? 15 years later, 15 years later, I'm sitting in this church uh, on a Sunday evening, and we're there, and we do all our things, and we go into all those details, and afterwards, this pastor stands up and says, uh, I want to encourage you. I mean, you were, were there from Singapore, and I'd preached, and he opens his pen, pencil case. I don't know what he's doing. And then he says, I've got a whole lot of special pens in here. And he starts going through them. And he says, this pen, he says, you gave me 15 years ago. He says, I've prayed for you very regularly. I've written sermons, and he talks all about the pen. Sorry. <laughs> you know what? I got the story all messed up. I'm sorry. I'm jet lagged. This is about four in the morning, South Africa time. I have to go back one step. I have to go back one step. Sorry. So the day before... We're in South Africa, and we're visiting family and friends. We have not been back for five years. And we are seeing people we've not seen for five years that we love. And we're realizing, like, out of sight, out of mind, but when you're there, you realize how much you love and miss people and family that you've got. And we're walking through all of their big homes with big lawns, and it's not quite our HDB flat in Bishan. And we had, just, we had, had a moment on the Saturday morning where for Taryn and I, it was, it was, it was difficult. And we both kind of had like a lump in our throat, like, Lord, this is a lot that we've walked away from. And, ju- and I was thinking through that, and I was feeling quite emotional, and one of my kids um, runs up to me, and seeing all this and processing it himself, independently of anything I'd said, says, gee, Dad, did we really have to leave South Africa? And I mean, oh, I just, we had to stop and just pray for a moment, Right? And I walked through that house for 10 minutes and I prayed. And what I prayed was this. I said, Lord, you know what we've sown and you know what we've given. And we'd do it in a heartbeat. But I'm asking you, won't you make it worthwhile? May there be kingdom fruit. May it not be in vain. May there be a blessing. So this is, Tara and I go home that night. We're praying about it. No one else in the whole world knows. So at the end of that service, this guy is going through his pencil case. And he's like, I've got a whole bunch of special pens here. Let me, and then he pulls out that pen. And he says, you gave this to me 15 years ago. And he said, today, I felt God prompt me, I'm giving this back to you. I'm like, you're giving back your pen? All right. That's a, that's a bit weird, right? But he said, I felt God asked me to do this because he wants to show you what you have sown, what you've given he will, he will bless. And then he takes out another pen that was a lot more valuable. <laughs> and he says, it's coming with this. Because God wants to tell you today what you've sown, you will reap far more than what you've sown. And God wants to encourage you with that. Friends, nobody in the world knew what we were going through with thinking and praying the day before. Yeah. Now, friends, do I know about sowing and reaping? Do I know that, that, that when we live for Jesus, he's going to cause a kingdom harvest? Yes, I was praying those things the day, the day before. It wasn't like I didn't know that from the scriptures. But our personal God, who knows us and loves us, wants to encourage us and guide us and put strength and encouragement and fortitude inside of us. And this, this is the, the artist in God. This is not just the utilitarian, pragmatic, hey, Paul's got to get to Macedonia. Can we organize you know, transport for him? Let's get him there as quick as possible. Let's save his legs. No, sometimes he goes in a roundabout route, and, but, but God's leading and guiding and speaking, and sometimes his plans are only going to get unfolded later on. Sometimes you, you sow something or you do something in obedience, and for 15 years you've forgotten about it. it, it it's, it's gone. But then God begins to weave stories together. My friends, I must be honest, I don't always want to live my life this way, actually. It sounds exciting when you have a story like that, right? Doesn't it? But do I want to like live my life all the time being guided and led by God? Actually, often I'm very happy to just make my own decisions. I mean, in accordance with biblical principles, I'm not going to like go and do something wicked or wrong, but like within that framework, hey, look, 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 you've given me the Bible, now let me just manage everything myself. Because that's far more comfortable for me, actually. I mean, I remember the night before I asked Taryn to be my girlfriend. And I was praying. I was praying. I remember where I was on that field in South Africa. And I was praying about it because I 
didn't want to do the wrong thing. But let me tell you, the first like 20, 30 minutes of that prayer, I'm not joking, was not, I wasn't really asking. I was like, I, I was doing a lot of asking, but I wasn't asking for any kind of real guidance. And then I remember it got to one point where I was like, Lord, if this is not your will, please like guide me and speak to me. And I remember getting on my knees and suddenly it got real because I wanted to ask her out. I wasn't like in two minds about it. I wasn't like, should I marry her? Should I not? I was like, she's godly. She's beautiful. This is a no-brainer. This is a no-brainer. But yeah, yeah but yeah, that's right. But yet, yet, I mean, look, we have freedom to make decisions. I mean, a Christian marrying another Christian, you, you have freedom to make that decision. I did have it, but I'm like, Lord, I want, I want you to guide me. I want everything I do to, to honor you. And he could have said no. I was terrified. Friends, it's not always convenient. And frankly, l- let me tell you, I, I mean, I'm a planner, right? I love strategy. I love thinking. I love planning. I love being organized and efficient and then executing a plan. And then you take it off on your to-do list afterwards. It's an amazing feeling, right? If you're not like me, don't worry. Um, the world needs your kinds of people as well, okay? <laughs> but, you know, when I run my whole life that way, and we're making decisions at church or what we should do or how I should do my job just based on, yeah, sound biblical principles, and what seems, what makes sense, but we're not actively engaging with God. Friends, we are miss, uh, some, we're missing out on an adventure that God wants to invite us into. And we're often doing it to protect our little semi-kingdom. Yes, within God's kingdom, but doing things our own way. But friends, God is not just pragmatic. He's a relational artist who makes things beautiful according to our high wisdom. He wants Paul to go to Philippi. It's going to be an important partner church for Paul in future. And friends, our salvation, Jesus, the, the fact that we can stand here and worship God and praise Him, and we know even if tragedy strikes us in 2023, nothing can separate us from the love of God. We're going to be raised to newness of life. We're going to live for Him, with Him for forever in eternity. Friends, all of these things are because of the surprising, perplexing can't figure out mystery, artistic mystery of God in the gospel, where when the answer to how a loving God who is holy could include us in his plan and bring us to be his people and yet forgive our sins and not dismiss them, when this puzzle seemed unsolvable, God in his artistic artistic beauty had a solution no one could have figured out that God himself would come. He would take on flesh. Jesus Christ would be born, live a a, a spotless life, live a righteous life. And then shockingly, Jesus would go willingly to the cross to die for our sins. And just when it seemed like, you know, Paul's getting blocked, Jesus, things couldn't get any worse. He rises again and God makes all things beautiful and everything sad becomes untrue. Even though when you're in the midst of it, it seems so difficult. And even Peter, who begins to hear that Jesus must go to the cross, responds how you and I would probably respond. No, Lord, surely not. That's ridiculous, Jesus. Are you you bonkers? Are you crazy? But yet, friends, Jesus only did, he says, what he saw the Father doing. He followed the Father. The Father, yes, that's plan and purpose for him was... Was, was, was complicated and difficult and did involve adversity and suffering. But as Philippians 2 says, he went down in death, but he is crowned with glory forever and ever and ever. Friends, how does this empower us to follow God? Friends, Jesus, his death, his resurrection for us, it empowers us by helping us see that, yes, though sometimes God's guidance in our lives is different to what we think is best or the decisions we would make. It ultimately leads to our greatest joy and his glory, and we can trust him entirely. So I want to encourage us as a church on this first Sunday of 2023 to walk with God. Friends, following God is not just a matter of principles. Yes, it's it's biblical truth and principles and eternal truth and the implications of the gospel and doctrine, yes. And supposing and trying to discern where God's leading us and prayer and and visions and praying with others and and, and discerning these things together. 
Friends, as a church, we want to be thoughtful, we want to be strategic, but most of all, we want to be prayerful, and we're trying to do that more as a staff and as, as office. I don't know if it's been announced because I've been away, but we're going to try and have monthly lunchtime prayers in the offices this year. Just more time to pray and just, and just seek God. And friends, this kind of walking with God, it's not like opposed to Scripture or the Bible. No, it's fueled by us filling ourselves, immersing ourselves with Scripture. Psalm 16, I was working through the Psalms when I was on leave, and Psalm 16 talks about at night, my heart instructs me. As David fills himself with God's word and God's truth, as he meditates on God's word, he finds God speaking to him through his heart at night as he, as he, as he fills himself with God's uh, truth and his word. Psalm 1, meditates on the Torah day and night. God knows their way. God guides their way. So how can I encourage us to practically do this? Friends, let's be praying about decisions that we're making. Sometimes, you know, I, I feel like just a, a check in my spirit. There's something we're doing at church or my personal life, and it seems right. I'm not breaking any commands, and it all seems like a good thing to do, but there's like a sense of, of a discomfort. And I've learned over the years with those checks just to stop and to pause and then to, to pray through it. Until, if I, until I've identified what is it that I feel uncomfortable about, what is it that God's trying to say? Is there something else I'm supposed to be thinking about? I want to encourage us to be open to others and other people's words of advice, etc. But friends, this doesn't mean that we become those who are paralyzed by inaction and are trying to like discern you know, every decision. Should I have like, you know, nasi lemak or bacho mi for lunch? And it's like, Lord, this is an important decision, you know? I need you to guide me. Um, no, friends, like, we don't try and read every tea, all the tea leaves and be paralyzed until then. Paul here is making decisions. He's a proactive guy. He's like, let's go back and visit those churches. We're on our way. But everything he's doing, he's, he's prayerful. He's submitting, it, he's submitting it to God. So I want to encourage us as a church and our ministries and your community groups, I want to encourage you in your personal life to make it your goal to serve the living God this year. Yes, make plans. Go on a mission for Him. Decide how you want to serve Him, but pray through them. Allow God to lead and to guide and to interrupt. And then in our second and short section this morning, our final one, we see how God causes kingdom growth where we cannot. And we see actually a similar theme coming through here. Let's read verse 11. Setting sail from Troas, we made direct voyage to Samothrace, and the following day to Neapolis, from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. So we're, Paul's heading to Macedonia because that's what they concluded. But God doesn't say where in Macedonia. Macedonia is a fairly large area. So it says, uh, we remained in the city some days. Uh, and so what it seems like, Paul's like, let's go to the, the, the leading city, the biggest city in Macedonia. Let's just go there. So they head there. We remained in the city for some days. And on the Sabbath, we went outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed that there was a place of prayer. Look here. I mean, Paul, some of us think, look, I mean, I can't do what Paul did because Paul had God talking to him all the time. Well, not in this verse. I mean, yeah, God guided them to Macedonia. But even then, they deduce, okay, let's go to Philippi. When they go to Philippi, they're like, what do we do? There's no synagogue here. So he says, they went down to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. In those days, if there were 10 Jewish men in a town, they would build a synagogue or they could form a synagogue. But before that, people would just gather for prayer. And so Paul knows there's no synagogue in the town. Let's head down to the river. Maybe there's some God-fearing people there who uh, are you know, worshipers of Yahweh and let's see if we can... Uh, find some of them. And what do you know? He supposes, presumes, tries to figure it out, and there he goes. There's Paul's proactivity. One who heard us was a woman by the name of Lydia, Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods who was a worshiper of God, likely a God-fearer, similar to Cornelius, uh, probably likely a Gentile, uh, not a, a Jew, but had come to uh, revere the uh, God of Israel and uh, you used to pray to God. And so Paul goes and meets with them, and then Paul begins to speak to her. We see this at the end of verse 14. It says, the Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. 
Now, I want you to just think about that last sentence. The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. So we've got two different things happening here. Paul is saying something. Paul's preaching. Paul's sharing about Jesus. He's preaching the gospel. But there's something that Paul can do, and there's something that Paul cannot do. What Paul can do is he can preach and proclaim. What Paul cannot do is open her heart. But while Paul is being faithful with what he can do, God does what only he can do. Our friends, sometimes we're praying for people to come to faith, our family members, parents, but we aren't, doing, we aren't sharing the faith with them. We were praying for this amazing miracle, and God's like, I put you in their life. You can be proactive. You be faithful, but then you trust me to do what only I can do. Friends, in their own strength, Paul and his companions could only have done so much. They're being led by God, they're being guided, and they're being faithful. But then they trust God to go and do what only he can do. One of the things we pray just about every Sunday when we gather at 8.30 to pray before our day starts is that God would take our worship team's preparation, the songs that they've prayed through, the lyrics of the songs, the sermon, the service leaders who've agonized over how to pray and how to lead us in confession and all their work and labors and the kids' ministry teachers and all the work that goes on here and the ushers who are going to smile and greet people and the, one, and the conversations we have. And we say, Lord, we've done all this preparation, but unless you work, this is going to come to nothing. There's going to be no spiritual fruit. So we need you, Lord God, to breathe upon those kidsmen classes and what gets said and the songs. Father, we need you to do this. Unless the Lord builds the house, the laborers labor in vain. So Father, we are being faithful. We have. We didn't just cruise in here at Sunday morning at like, you know, 7.10 and be like, oh, what should I preach today, you know? No, we are working hard. But friends, unless God acts, it's all going to be in vain. And we pray and we pray and we pray and we trust God. My friends, my own inclination, I love to work in my own strength. I love to work in my own strength. I love to make a plan. I love to be organized. That's what I'm like. But the whole nature of the Christian gospel is that I cannot save myself. The gospel doesn't come and say, okay, Simon, you're a proactive guy. You just do these seven steps and you'll get to heaven. No, the gospel, the good news of the gospel comes and says, Simon, you think you're like got your life together. You're a dirty, rotten sinner. You're so far from God, you wouldn't even recognize him if you bumped into him in a room. You live for yourself all, all the time. You put on a, ma like a masquerade of not being a bad person, but your heart is wicked. And you can't even save yourself. There's nothing you can do to redeem yourself. That's why the gospel, the Bible tells us, is so was so offensive to Jewish people. The offense of the cross is not that you don't have to do anything to save yourself. The offense of the cross to Jewish people is you can't do anything to save yourself. God has to save you. And God, this is the Christian message. That's why it's good news. The good news is that though we cannot redeem ourselves and save ourselves by our charity, by being kind to people, I mean, it's good to be charitable and kind. Please do those things. But that's not going to earn your way into heaven. You, your, your righteousness is too far away from God's. You cannot be saved by your own efforts. So the offense of the gospel is that you cannot save yourself. The cross says you, someone has to do something for you. Jesus Christ has to die for you. He has to rise again. And so when I enter into the Christian faith, having my pride dismantled, my humility exposed, it, it does make me humble. It makes me realize I'm not, you know, um, passive. I want to live for God, but the whole way I've come into the faith is by receiving His gifts, by receiving His mercy and, and His grace. He's the one that's had to work in me. And so, so therefore, friends, self-reliance is a complete anathema. It's complete anathema to the Christian. We, we now seek to live by faith, to trust God, to follow Him and believe Him. Because God has sent His Son, Jesus, we can now believe Him. We can now proclaim him. We can now rejoice in him. We must respond. But we rely and depend upon him completely. When I was uh, away, oh, put my Bible over my watch, over my phone. When I was away, uh, one of the things in Psalms that actually struck me the most as I slowly worked through uh, a number of the Psalms was how the theme of waiting on God 
came through so many times, and particularly how the idea of God's strength and God's strengthening people came through the Psalms. And what I saw again and again, Psalm 27 in particular, was that in the Scriptures, strength, true strength, is not just God making our muscles bigger or giving us um, yeah, an ability to do something ourselves, but is actually being dependent upon Him and praying for Him and waiting for God to act. There's a very counterintuitive kind of strength there. And I'm praying that God would make us this year to be a strong people who are not strong because we have like a brain's trust that figures things out or good policies. Yeah, we do want to have all of those things. But the people who wait on God, who are faithful with our tasks, but then ask God to do what only He can do. So friends, this year, can I encourage us as a church to recognize we are a church under the Lordship of Jesus, and every one of us is under Him to be guided by Him. He is the head, our spiritual head, Christ our head, our authority. And can we recognize that, that this head, this Jesus, who we worship as a person, not just a philosophy, not just principles, but one who loves us, who leads us, who guides us for his sake and for kingdom growth. I want to encourage you to respond to God this morning. You may be here, you may not be a Christian. If you're here and you aren't a Christian this morning, I would invite you to put your faith in Jesus. Maybe you've been trying to save yourself by your own religious deeds attending church periodically, trying to be a good person or not a bad person. And this morning, as you hear the message, you are realizing you've misunderstood Christianity. Christianity is good news of what Jesus has done to save you. Friends, maybe this morning the Lord is opening your heart to hear this message. And the scriptures would encourage you this morning to put your faith in God, to lay a hold of Jesus by believing him by trusting Him. For everyone here who is a Christian, friends, God no doubt is speaking to us this morning, inviting us to come to Him as our personal God, to surrender ourselves, to give ourselves to Him, and to say to Him, Lord, I want to follow You. I want You to lead me and guide me so that my life can be lived for Your sake. Let's go to Him and pray now. Father, we praise you that you're not just great and distant and transcendent and holy. You are all of those things. But Lord, you are near and imminent and kind and patient and you care about our lives. I praise you for this, Lord God. I pray that in 2023, we at this church would walk with you more closely and dearly. You would lead us and do amazing things through us, Lord God. Not for our sake, not for our glory, but for your sake and for your glory. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. You've been listening to a sermon podcast from Redemption Hill Church. You can find more of our sermons online at www.rhc.org.sg.